from science fiction to science fact, with Jenny Curtis and Chris Porter from Solar. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week, we're going to look at the history of science fiction and talk about how these stories enrich the soil from which science grows, advancing our species to our future among the stars. We're going to be talking with Jenny Curtis and Chris Porter from the new hit podcast, Solar, starring Helen Hunt. Now, science fiction stories set in worlds where science has changed society for good or bad plays a central role in the development of society and culture. The genre has, in one form or another, been a part of the human psyche since antiquity. Now, roughly 1800 years ago, the Assyrian author Lucian of Samosata wrote True History, a, his a story involving space travel, parroting tales of Homer and others. Uh, caught up by whirlwinds during a journey at sea, the characters in this story find themselves on the moon. There, they're caught up in a war between the kings of the sun and moon over control of Venus, because of course. And you know what? I can name a dozens of movies with plot lines worse than this one. Now, in 1638, The Man in the Moon, the first known work of science fiction in English, was written by a bishop named Francis Godwin, uh, being published following the death of the author. The protagonist in this tale, Domingo Gonzalez, flies to the moon in a spaceship powered by wild geese. They're probably honking all the way. It was like the Long Island Expressway, right? Right? So, while these early sci-fi tales depended on natural forces like wild gee, like wild winds or geese with a penchant for space travel to carry the story and the spaceship, the last great ingredient for modern science fiction, technology, would first be seen in a novel printed in 1818. On a rainy day in 1816, writer Mary Shelley was staying in the house with her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, their friend Lord Byron, and Byron's physician, John Polidori. The friends told ghost stories, and conjured up a challenge to see which could write the most engaging tale. The first work of modern science fiction, Frankenstein, came to life. Or was that back to life? Incidentally, Polidori's entry, The Vampire, with a Y, became a horror classic. Now, as the American Civil War wound down, science fiction heated up with works from Jules Verne's and H.G. Wells. Verne produced a trio of masterworks over just a few years. Journey to the Center of the Earth was released in 1864, followed the next year by From the Earth to the Moon. These were topped off by 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in 1869. Now, technology was detailed in stories by Verne, while Wells focused more on using the storylines to advance lightly disguised social commentary. The Time Machine by Wells, for instance, is largely a critique of English class <laughs> society of his era. Now, Amazing Stories magazine, founded in 1926, gave birth to the Pulp Fiction format, which actually has surprisingly little to do with Quentin Tarantino. This was the first major publication ever devoted exclusively to science fiction. I like sci-fi. Now, on Halloween night, 1938, tales of an invasion of Martians landing in New Jersey resulted in a number of people panicking, calling police and the military to save them from the alien invaders. The War of the Worlds had shown the power of science fiction over the human zeitgeist. In Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, 
please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. In 1940, a budding young science fiction author named Isaac Asimov published his fifth story, Ring Around the Sun, in the pulp classic, Future Fiction. Asimov would go on to write more than 500 books during his lifetime. But this work is usually considered the first great science fiction story focused on our parent star. Today, Solar, a new science fiction podcast, tells the story of a stranded crew on a mission to the region of space near the sun. We talk with Jenny Curtis and Chris Porter about this exciting new series. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we look at the new hit sci-fi podcast, Solar. It's recently hit number one in science fiction and number two in fiction on Apple Podcasts. This show stars Stephanie Beatrice, Alan Cumming, Jonathan Bangs, and the ever-delightful Helen Hunt. We're delighted to be joined by creator Chris Porter, as well as director Jenny Curtis. Welcome to the show, folks. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So first, I'd like to start with you, Chris, since I'm assuming the show pretty much started with you. Um, (laughs) Give us a brief intro to Solar and tell us a little bit about what it's about. Well, Solar is about a spacecraft that has been damaged after being overpowered by an enormous solar flare that was pointed directly at Earth, meaning after it took out the ship, it went straight to Earth and uh, wreaked havoc there as well. The surviving astronauts are stuck on different parts of the ship and are trying to figure out not only how to communicate and help each other when they're separated by both space and... Uh, uh, sound and video quality, but also if there's a way that they can reach Earth, and not only that, but if there is a, a an Earth that they can reach, because if, in the event of a solar flare, it would knock out all communications and electronics, so is there even any way that they could get rescued before it's too late for them to survive? Hmm. I just want to addendum a solar yeah. flare of a solar flare of the size of the solar flare in our show because solar flares are real and happen all the time and they don't knock out all of the communication. This is a very, very big one. Yeah. And actually the sun the sun is actually going through quite an active phase right now. It's shooting up some pretty It's good timing for us. I know. I I, I think so, you know, right that wave. That's right. (laughs) And so just again, Chris, like how how did how did this idea come up in your mind? So I, I, I really enjoy science fiction, and I started when I was like, you know, if Blue Sky, if I could do any sort of a science fiction story, what would be a fun thing to try to tackle? Hmm. And I started thinking about, like, all this, you know, we're going to the far edge of the solar system, we're going to Alpha Centauri, we're going to all of these distant planets, and all of a sudden I was like, what if we just went inside and we went straight to the sun, and uh, then it would be this cool juxtaposition of the us, helpless, helpless human beings up against this unfathomable force of nature. Uh, and that just really excited me. So the story started to spiral out from there. But then I got to play all sorts of fun questions in my head. Well, like, you know, is privatized space flight is becoming a real thing with SpaceX. Mm-hmm. And like, how is that going to work with NASA in the public sector? And how, how are these things going to shapeshift over the next 25 odd years to be what it is in the future to make this type of a voyage happen? And that's where the story really started to get exciting and Twisty is the way I'll put it. Twisty, I like that. That's, yeah. that's a good word. And Jenny, how did you how did you come into this come into this project? Um, uh, so from the beginning, when Chris pitched it to Kurt Co, I am a member of Kurt Co, and so we kind of dove in together into the development phase. And uh, she was brought in very early on, just to reiterate that. Yeah, <laughs> she's been a part of this from pretty Five much a early. week after I had the idea. <laughs> Um, but basically, uh, yeah, we, Chris and I would chat about his ideas. He would go home and think some more and write some more and come back. And then we would have workshops over the script with some actors. And then he would go home and think some more and work some more. And it was kind of, I was a sounding board for ideas for about a year. Mm-hmm. And I would say, you know, sounds good or what if or how about. And sometimes he would listen and sometimes he wouldn't. And <laughs> I think most times I would listen. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, I wasn't like dictating things, but it was, uh, we worked together and I think I tried to be the best sounding board I could be through the development process. And then I got more uh, hands on when we went into production because I worked with the actors very uh, intensely, we'll say, because I'm a performer myself. So that was uh, where my strong suit was. Hmm. And of course you all quickly gathered, you know, this amazing group around you of actors and audio people. We're going to talk about the audio later on. But how did this form? Was it, did you group together pretty quickly or how did it happen? Oh, I wish we could say it was quick. No, it was a long, <laughs> drawn out process. Yes, it was. <laughs> we, As we the best stories are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We anticipated it being quick and then this thing called the pandemic hit mm, and suddenly thing. things got a lot harder. Um, so All the way casting, down the line. <laughs> yeah, uh, for everything. But like for casting, especially, it became uh, for the the names that you recognize that you've listed off already. They were all offers. So it became a long drawn out process of sending offers to agents and waiting for responses and waiting for people to read scripts. And that process that we thought would last a few months lasted much longer. So the overall casting uh, slowed down, I think, drastically. When when people were not in their offices. But we take that as a gift to the writing because it was more time for Chris and I to chat and develop. And Chris got to talk to, you know, scientists and and mm -hmm. do a lot more research. And I think the, the, the script got a lot richer because we had more time to uh, explore it. And it was, it was also, uh, uh both blessing and a curse the fact that we had a more drawn out casting process because we could only have one actor in the booth at a time due to mm -hmm. restrictions uh, so as a result we'd be recording you know one character and we were still working on negotiating the other character but at least we had this one character you know recorded and edited and it was thanks to jenny's amazing the only other person who could be in the booth was jenny and so she was able to to modulate those performances so that they would fit together even though they were recorded months apart yeah. there was one actor who came in later in the process and in the booth they were like um i feel like this should be said differently and our response was basically like well every other person in the show has already recorded so we can't change the way we're saying it we're so sorry <laughs> So it's fun stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and one of the really, really amazing things about this show <clears throat> are the, is the incredible quality of the audio track. It's just so, so immersive. It, you know, I listened, the first time I listened to it, I listened um, on a pair of headphones, a pair of good studio quality headphones, and it was just, things were just all around me. So first, I like to... No, Chris, did, did you picture having this type of audio immersiveness when you first imagined the show, or is that something that developed later on? It was always the goal to have a really high-end audio experience. Like, it, from the get-go, even in the script, I would be denoting, like, you hear a broken fan in the background. Like, I, I knew that sound was going to be super important in the show. But when we brought in our sound designer, CJ Drummiller, he exceeded even my expectations of where I wanted it to be. So it was definitely something that I always wanted. I just didn't know we'd be able to achieve it as well as we did. And now it's like a badge of honor of like, we can do this. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> That's great. And so that gets handed off to you, Jenny. These, you know, Chris or, you know, somebody may say, you know, hey, we have this idea and we need this computer running over here and, you know, a cat meowing in the background there and, you know, <laughs> and somebody screaming in the background over here. How, how, how do you go through the process of bringing these ideas to life? Uh, you know, and Chris and I talk about this all the time. We actually come from our background before podcasting is immersive theater, which mm. is the type of theater that happens outside of proscenium stage. You're in a location. There's things going on in rooms around you. Sometimes you can hear a scene down the hall and that's affecting the scene you're in. So it was actually a really natural way for us to tell a story because that's how we approach creativity already. And it was just a new type of medium for us to explore this kind of immersive storytelling and I think that really gave us a leg up on creating a world that uh, utilized those tools. 
Absolutely incredible. I love the whole idea and it seems like it would just be so, I don't know how to say this, but reciprocal, like a really good concert. Like, you know, it could be the actor feeding into the audience that feeds into the actor. Um, so, what, I'd like to hear from both of you on this one, but I'd like to start with Chris. What do you hope that people take away from this show? So, I, I hope that there's a ton of takeaways and people find little clips of themselves in every single character out there. But in all honesty and sincerity, my biggest message is the idea that you are not alone. Uh, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, we're all trying to row a boat in, in some hopefully positive direction. And I, even if you're the most alone person in the universe, you're never actually entirely alone. Hmm. Yes. That's great. It's a great thing. How about you, Jenny? Um, I mean, that, that's definitely part of it. I'll say I, I, I'm going to steal from Chris in my answer because he always says uh, that he comes to his stories with this term. I hope I'm not about to butcher it, but uh, he considers all of his stories as being at the core. The world is broken and we're all trying to put it back together. And so it. it's... <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I love that. I love that. So it's this story of like, how are we putting ourselves back together, the world around us back together. It approaches so many different topics that are relevant to me personally, and I, I hope they resonate with everybody listening, of what is your self-worth? What is it to connect to another person? What is it to be a human? And how, how can you learn to love yourself with all of your flaws? And um, while I wanted to stick to the more scientific stuff, because I know that's what this show is for you, <laughs> To me, the, the poeticism in this show speaks to me more than anything else because it, it is really life-affirming in all of the challenges that our characters face. So do you think that's one of the ways that science fiction can help inspire humanity? Yes. I mean, yeah. honestly, I do think so. And I think that's the magical thing about science fiction is it's one of the genres in which your your imagination continues expanding and so to take that and put it into real life we don't know what the bounds of our own limits are and having some stories inspire us to go farther and explore deeper and try to figure out how we can grow or invent or anything like that i, I think stories for ever have been inspiring people to explore further in real life that's great. And again, I'm going to ask both of you this question. And once again, I'm going to start with Chris. Who inspired you in science fiction? Who did you grow up reading and watching? So I, I definitely, my father was a huge Star Trek fan. Uh, so my family, when I was in, in <laughs> very young, my family had a Sunday night ritual of watching Star Trek Voyager. So I can't quite say that I'm a Trekkie, but I have seen a lot of Star Trek Voyager in particular, which is, mm -hmm. I know, not considered the ultimate uh, Star Trek experience. But, like, because of that, Star Trek like was Voyager. in my blood. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, but I, I, if, if I had to pinpoint, obviously, there's a lot of movies out there that I found inspiring. Alien was hugely inspiring. I, I, Gravity. I loved Gravity. I was obsessed mm -hmm. with that. I, but uh, if there is a book, I, which is more dystopian than science fiction, but it's a canical for Leibowitz, mm. I which I, I have cited repeatedly of being like, whoa, that's, this story just hits every button for me of it being so insightful to the human spirit, but also just so deeply strange and beautiful and both angry and hopeful. And I loved that. And so that's been a bastion for me as well. It's fabulous. Yeah. How about you, Jenny? Who inspired you in science fiction? Um, and this is going to be a more modern one Please. because uh, it, it stands out to me. But Britt Marling, who is a creator and an actor, um, she created the OA, which if you haven't seen that show, I think is just beautifully done. Um, I think there, we talk about this all the time. There were two <laughs> seasons of it and unfortunately was canceled before the third season. But it's just a really stunning show uh, that I feel like tackles similar themes to what we tried to tackle, but uses the broader uh, spectrum of sci-fi to tackle them. And 
that kind of grounded, quiet depth to uh, sci-fi was really exciting to me. So I would say check out the OA. Also, she has a film called Another Earth. I really loved that one. Um, but Britt Marling, if you're listening, I love you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful. And so what's, what's next for Solar? And either one of you could take this? Uh, we, I'll I, let Chris finish oh, it up, but like I, I just want to say we're halfway through uh, our release, and what's next is we're going to try as hard as we can to get people to keep finding out about it and listening, because, uh, spoiler alert, that's not a spoiler, I think this is one of the coolest finales of a show that I've ever heard in podcasting, and I really, really, really want people to hear it, and I'm so excited that we're like five weeks away from it, so start catching up on the show now so that you're there when we release this. <laughs> I, I, I'll also say just on the heels of that that I... I the early seasons of Arrested Development, I love. And one of the things that they did so well is they rewarded you for going back to watch it again and again and again. Mm. Uh, you would catch more details and hear more jokes and get more double entendres. And so not that there's double entendres in Solar. It's a very different breed. But I wanted to make sure that the experience was the same, that every time you listen to it, you are rewarded with something. Like, hey, now I'll get that this when this person asks this question, it's right relating to this other scene that I haven't heard yet. So like, I, I will say that when all the episodes are out hopefully you will be rewarded to just go back and binge them all again and get all the loose threads that we were trying to tie together yeah uh, as far as for what's next i'm just gonna say once <clears throat> once the season is out we definitely have a whole world of story possibilities and we would be thrilled to explore them all uh in due time and that is what our sites are aiming for it's an ever-expanding world, like the right. ever-expanding universe. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. I love that. <laughs> yeah, all right. And on that note, that was uh, Chris Porter, creator, and Jenny Curtis, director of the new hit sci-fi podcast, Solar. Check it out anywhere you get your podcasts. In 1945, the stories of Arthur C. Clarke told of radio waves bouncing between satellites. Today, communication satellites regularly make use of this technology. The atomic explosions over Hiroshima and Nagasaki that same year made clear both the powers and the dangers of scientific advances. This led to the great, really, really terrible movies of the 1950s and 60s, such as Plan 9 from Outer Space and Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, not to mention Godzilla. Star Trek aired its first episode in September 1966, changing science fiction forever. The effect this series had on real-life science cannot be overstated. The first space shuttle designed for atmospheric tests was even named Enterprise in honor of this classic television series. The communicators imagined in this timeline preceded cellular phones and the mobile personal access display devices or pads used by Captain Picard and others bear a striking resemblance to the iPads of today or 10 years ago. Anything is possible on the holodeck where people interact with intelligent avatars playing active roles in stories which unfold around them. Virtual environments are now being developed using augmented reality and artificial intelligence. Such systems could be the next great system for storytelling after television and video games, allowing viewers to become part of an unfolding tale. While Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry, like Vern before him, kept careful watch on the science in his stories, the other great sci-fi franchise of the 1970s, Star Wars, was reminiscent of the stories of Wells, moral tales with only the slightest explanation of underlying technology. Kyber crystals? Really? That's it? Metachlorians? What? Now, the great science fiction writers of the modern age, including Margaret Atwood, Philip 
Philip K. Dick, and Octavia Butler are still pushing the limits of human imaginations today. As the wealth gap grows and technology advances, cyberpunk sci-fi now explores dystopian worlds at the junction of abject poverty and high technology. Climate fiction, or cli-fi, is a hot new genre in a rapidly warming world. It's too bloody hot. These stories not only entertain and inspire science, but they also help us answer some of the greatest questions we as a society will face in coming years. Once artificial intelligence reaches, reaches sentience, would it have so-called human rights? What are the benefits and dangers of human cloning? How might advances in technology affect rights to privacy and due process? Minority Report, anyone? Science fiction is the way we dream, paving the way for real world science. Join us next week as we head off exploring the Milky Way galaxy. I'm gonna welcome Dr. Joe Pesh to the show, talking about the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Make sure to join us starting on the 7th of June. Please subscribe, follow, and share this show on all your favorite social media, and watch your favorite episodes anytime at thecosmiccompanion.tv. Clear skies, beam me up.